Welcome to another video. We're going to use the arc length formula to find the length of this arc. Now, it looks like an entire function because it actually is an entire function. And normally when you get a question like this asking you to find how long an arc is or the length of a curve, you're told where the curve starts and where it ends and that becomes the limit of your integration. But in this case, we don't have any limit of integration because you're expected to find it yourself. And what does that mean? Whenever you have the sum of two functions, you have to be careful because what works here may not work here. So you have to look at the domain of one of the functions, compare it to the domain of the other, and wherever they have an intersection, that is where the sum of the functions exists. If both of them have different domains, the function will not exist. If they have a part of their domain that is common to both of them, that is where the function exists. If one has a bigger domain than the other, you just take the smaller one because that's where it exists. And that's the skill we're gonna learn here and use to compute this. Let's get into the video. So the first thing we're going to do is find the domains of each of these functions and then compare them in order to save space also because of the different kinds of integration that I'm going to do. I'm going to do that as side work here. So we're going to say, how do you get the domain of this? Well, you can see that this is a square root function and the domain of the square root function, whatever is inside the square root function has to be Yes, at least zero. So it has to be a positive number. So we know that x minus x squared must be greater than or equal to zero. And then we can find the domain of this function. Now, what does that mean? Because we're using greater than, you can make your life easy, okay? You can switch this to less than so you don't have to draw the sign chart. That's what I do now, okay? I'm gonna multiply both sides by negative one. So if you multiply this by negative one, it becomes x squared minus x, and then the sign changes. Multiply this by negative one, you get zero. So now when I solve this, I, whatever I get, my answer will be between the two values for all less than quadratics, I know that. So I'm gonna say this is x times x minus one. Okay, it's less than or equal to zero. x equals zero or x equals one, so that my x is between zero and one. This is the domain that I have. So my domain is from zero to one. You see what I did there? I didn't have to draw the sign chart because anytime you solve a less than quadratic, you'll always have two, when you get two answers, your answer is always between them. Always, okay. now. So we just got the domain for this part. Now let's go compare to this side. What is the domain of cosine inverse of the square root of x? Now I'm gonna ask myself the main function. See here, the main function was the square root. Here the main function is the inverse cosine. So what is the domain of inverse cosine? Whatever you feed into the inverse cosine fu function, the arc sine function has to be from negative one to one. That's the domain. So that means this has to be between negative one and one. So we can say that, just as we did here, we can say that negative one must be less than or equal to the square root of x, and this must be less than or equal to one. When this is squared, it becomes x. The square of one is one. But you notice that this cannot, just, cannot be one. You can't say this is one, so this becomes zero because the square of any negative now flips to the other side and everything becomes positive. This is something you need to know that if negative, so if I square everything, see what happens? The middle becomes one, squared is one, but this becomes four. What does this become? That becomes four, which is this same guy. So what's going to be here? One thing we're sure of is the square of anything here will be positive 
because when you square anything, it becomes positive. So this is always a transformation that happens for this type of inequality. And that's what we're going to use. So now we see that the domain of this function is from 0 to 1. So what we can do now is compare this domain to this domain. Fortunately for us, they have the exact same domains, so it means that's where they exist. There's nothing outside of it. So we just say, okay, the intersection of both domains. So we're going to say that the domain of y will be equal to the domain 1 intersection, the domain of this second function. So let's call this d1, call this d2, so that we have the domain of this is the intersection of 1, sorry, of 0, 1. 0, 1, intersection of 0, 1, which is 0, 1. Okay, so now we know our limits of integration. We're going to integrate from 0 to 1, and that's what we just did here. So let's write the formula for the arc length of any function and then get all the things we need to plug into the formula. So we're going to say that the arc length is given by the integral from a to b of the square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx. I like to write it this way because it takes less space. So since we know that is y, so let's find y prime. Um, and in this case, our a is um, 0, or b is 1. Okay, so this is our a, and this is b. So we go, we say y y prime will be equal to the derivative of each of these. So firstly, what is the derivative of any square root function? Remember what I told you. If you watch my previous videos, anytime you have a square root of anything and you want to take the derivative, immediately write this. This is x minus x squared. I have just written what's going to be under. What's going to be on top is the derivative of the argument of the square root function, which is going to be the derivative of this is 1 and this is 2x. So it's 1 minus 2x. You're done. We go to the next one. What is the derivative of the of arc cosine? Now, as a calculus student, you have to have this memorized because you don't want to go back to do it all the time. It is similar to the derivative of the arc sine function and have it memorized. It's just with a negative. Okay, so what we're going to do is remember those strict substitution you do. You know that the denominator is going to contain something like this, 1 minus x squared. But unfortunately, we don't have x here. We have the square root of x. So you're going to write the square root of x here, squared. And then you have minus 1 on top. That is the first thing you need to know. Then I'm not going to show you how this is obtained because that's a lot. That's another video which I think I've done in the past. Okay, yes, I know. Even from first principles, maybe not. I'm not sure. Okay, let's go on. Now, then you multiply by the derivative of the inside. What's the derivative of the inside? We use the same trick we used here. It's going to be, you're going to have 2 times the square root. 2 times the square root of x, and on top will be the derivative of this, which is just 1. So that's what we have. If we clean this up, this is going to look like this. 1 minus 2x over 2 times the square root of x minus x squared, plus minus 1 times this is going to be minus 1, okay? And over... Now, if we multiply... Oh, by the way... The square root of x, when you square it, is just going to be x. So I can easily rewrite this as x. Okay, so I have 1 minus x, but I need to multiply it by 2 times the square root of x. Because the 2 have a square root, I can bring this x inside so that what I have is 2 times the square root of x minus x squared. Ta-da! And you see what? This the denominator here is exactly this denominator, which means we can easily add the numerators, which is going to be 1 minus 2x minus 1. 1 minus 1 is going to give us 0. So what we have left is just negative 2x over this. Okay, now we can see that this 2 can get rid of this 2. So we're going to have 
y prime is equal to negative x over the square root of x minus x squared. But remember the mission is to get y prime squared, then add 1 to it. So we're going to try and do that. Let's square first. I'm going to square this. And I'm going to square this. But when I square this, what I'm going to get will be, this is going to become x squared. And the square root sign under will disappear and becomes x minus x squared. And that's my y prime squared. I'm trying to keep track of what I'm doing. <laughs> now, we can factor out 1x or divide everything by x so that what is left will be um, equal to x. 1x remains on top. This becomes 1 and this is minus x. So that's our y prime. Ah, okay, now we need to add 1 to it. We just need to add 1. We need to add this one. So. Let's look at this. y prime squared plus 1 will be x over 1 minus x plus 1. And anytime you're adding 1 to a fraction, I recommend don't write 1. Write the denominator of the fraction divided by the same denominator. That is 1. Always do that. You make your work faster. So what do you have? So we're going to have x plus 1 minus x. Ooh, what's going on here? We're going to have x plus 1 minus x. So we just have 1 left. Oh, interesting. So this is what we've got. And we just need to go plug this in our formula. Because now we've gotten what we have. So now if we take the square root, let's even finish it. What if we take the square root of 1 plus y prime squared and take the square root it means we're taking the square root of the top and the bottom but the square root of one is one so the only thing that you need to put a square root sign on is this and so we have our formula i want to draw a straight line i think that line is good enough okay and so we have our formula and we can do our integration so let's go here so the length of the curve will be equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x dx. Isn't this beautiful? All that we have done has resolved into this very easy integral to compute. Now, I want to say this. Whenever you get a problem like this, the hardest part is the algebra and cleaning up and getting this, especially this part it will always resolve into something very simple. Because don't forget, the person who made up the question already solved it. If it was too hard, they usually would not put it there. Okay, so here we go. How do we integrate this? Definitely, looking at this, a u substitution is gonna save us. So let's do it. So we say let u be equal to, oh, another thing and a video I'm planning to make, whenever you do a u substitution, take as much as possible. Okay, so what would I make my u? Most people will take 1 minus x as their u, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all of it. Okay, now I know that this is an improper integral because there's some discontinuity at this point, right? Because when you plug in 1 here, you're going to have 0 in the denominator. So um, I may have to rewrite this integral and take the limit, okay, until I come back. But it doesn't really affect what we're about to do because once I do the u substitution, that improper integral problem will no longer be there. It might be there, but I'll see how to rewrite it. Let's do the u substitution first. So let u be the square root of 1 minus x. So what is, so that means that u squared equals 1 minus x. And if I take the derivative, it's going to be 2u du will be equal to negative dx. And I can move the negative here and make this positive like that. Let's go back. Oh, because I have said u is the square root of 1 minus x, now I have to do my boundaries correctly. So when u is evaluated at 0, that's the lower boundary, 
we plug in zero here, it's going to be one minus zero, which is square root of one, which is equal to one. And when u is evaluated at one, it's going to be square root of zero. So that's going to be zero. Now we can rewrite this integral now as the length being equal to the integral. Okay, I'm going to leave space here going from one to zero. And what I have is now one over u. This one over u, I'm going to replace dx with um, all of this. That's going to be times negative 2u du. I can see that this u cancels this u. So by that substitution, I have escaped the whole improper integral saga that was resting here. So now if I cancel this and cancel this, what I have left, and this minus sign can help me flip this limit of integration back to 0, 1. And then I have 2, just 2 sitting here, du. And I know, because I'm, an, I'm a calculus student, I can just bring back a u. So it's going to be 2u evaluated from 0 to 1, which is going to be 2 times, if you put 1 here, and you put zero here, you're gonna get two times one, which is equal to two, which is the value of this integral. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning, stop living. Bye-bye.